On this day, 50 years ago, one of the largest freighters ever to set sail in the region went down in a violent storm, taking all 29 of the crew. What really sank the Edmund Fitzgerald? We've heard the theories, the storm, the waves, the hatch covers, but a new exploration just found something that blows all those theories out of the water. A state-of-the-art underwater drone penetrated the ship's bridge, a place untouched for 50 years. And what it found inside is an anomaly that science can't explain. We can turn around and put our ROV down and we can actually get a better idea of what we're actually seeing. This isn't just another dive. It's a discovery that rewrites the final chapter of the Great Lakes' greatest mystery and the loss of its 29 crewmen. What the drone saw. The date is November 10th, 2024, almost 50 years to the day since the Edmund Fitzgerald vanished. A high-tech research vessel floats above the coordinates of the wreck. Down below, it's a graveyard. The water is a permanent 34 degrees. The pressure is over 230 pounds per square inch. It's a lightless, crushing void. Previous dives had mapped the outside of the wreck. They showed the ship snapped in two, the bow upright, the stern upside down. But the bridge, the ship's command center, was always too dangerous to enter. It's a tangle of collapsed steel and snagged wires. Sending a human diver or even a clumsy robot inside was a one-way trip. But this time is different. The team is using a new drone. It's a small, grapefruit-sized submersible equipped with high-definition cameras, LIDAR, and an AI navigation system. So it allows us to see the bottom of the lake, and if we're fortunate enough to actually find a shipwreck, we can go back use the lower frequency. It's designed to slip through cracks, avoid hazards, and build a perfect 3D model of what it sees. On the research ship, the control room is silent. The pilot guides the drone toward the bow. The massive 729-foot ship looms out of the darkness, a ghost coated in a thick layer of rust and silt. The drone zips over the deck, past the broken hatch covers, and approaches the pilot house. The windows of the bridge are all blown out from the pressure of the sinking. The drone pilot finds an opening and slowly, carefully nudges the machine inside. The first images from inside the bridge crackle onto the screen. It's chaos. Silt covers everything, inches deep. Wires hang from the ceiling like seaweed. The ship's wheel is still there, buried in muck. The crew's coffee mugs are still in their holders filled with mud. It's exactly what scientists expected to see after five decades in the deep. Then the drone's light hits something. In the back corner of the control room, sitting on a mangled console, is a single object. The AI camera zooms in. It's a heavy brass engine order telegraph. This is the device the captain would have used to send speed commands to the engine room. But here's the catch. It's not buried in silt. It's not covered in rust. It's clean not just clean, but polished. The brass gleams in the drone's lights as if someone had shined it that morning. There is not a speck of silt, not a trace of the bacterial rusticles that cover every other inch of the wreck. It is a perfect, impossible anomaly. Maybe it's not a shipwreck at all. It might be a big pile of rocks, a big clay formation on the bottom of the lake, which there's plenty of that. It's not often you look at it the first time around and, and absolutely know, oh my gosh, this is a shipwreck. But there are times where that's the case. Back on the ship, the research team is stunned. It makes no sense. Nothing, absolutely nothing, can survive for 50 years at the bottom of Lake Superior without being completely covered and corroded. The lake's current isn't strong enough to sandblast one single item clean while leaving everything around it buried. A chemical leak might dissolve rust, but it wouldn't polish the brass. They check the data. They rerun the scans. The drone's sensors confirm it. The object is there. It is brass. And it is spotless. The crazy part is this discovery shatters all the old theories. A storm didn't polish that telegraph. A shoal didn't scrub it clean. This one impossible object opens up a new, terrifying question. What really happened in the final moments inside that bridge? The drone's discovery of this impossible object forces us to look back at the entire story. The Ship of Luxury To understand why this anomaly is so shocking, you have to understand what the Edmund Fitzgerald was. She wasn't just a ship, she was THE ship. When she was launched on June 7, 1958, she was the largest and most expensive freighter ever built on the Great Lakes. They called her the Queen of the Lakes. 
She was 729 feet long, the maximum size that could fit through the Sioux locks. This is one of the most well-known shipwrecks in American history. Today marks 50 years since the Edmund Fitzgerald sank in Lake Superior. And get this, she wasn't just a workhorse. She was a floating palace. While most sailors lived in cramped basic quarters, the Fitzgerald's crew had air conditioning and tile bathrooms. She even had a luxury guest lounge and pantry for company executives. She was the first Laker built with an all-welded hull, a design that was supposed to make her stronger than any ship before her. For 17 years, she was the pride of the American side. She broke cargo records six times, hauling over 26,000 tons of taconite iron ore pellets from Minnesota to the steel mills in Detroit and Toledo. She was fast, she was strong, and everyone believed she was unsinkable. But there were signs, omens. Yeah, about that, her launch in 1958 was a complete mess. It took the woman christening her three tries to break the champagne bottle against the hull. That's a huge bad omen for sailors. When the ship finally slid sideways into the water, it created a massive wave that soaked the crowd of 15,000 spectators. The wave was so unexpected that one man watching reportedly suffered a heart attack right on the spot and perished. It was not the smooth start anyone wanted. Still, the ship earned the trust of the men who worked her. Her final captain, Ernest McSorley, was a 44-year veteran of the lakes. He was a quiet, respected man, not a risk taker. This trip in November 1975 was supposed to be one of his last. He was planning to retire at the end of the season. He and his crew of 28 men trusted that ship. They had sailed her through hundreds of storms. They had no reason to believe this one would be any different. That flawless record and that deep trust just make the ship's final silent disappearance even more chilling. The Silent Disappearance On November 9, 1975, the Fitzgerald loaded 26,116 tons of taconite pellets and left Superior, Wisconsin. A second ship, the Arthur M. Anderson, was traveling with her about 10 to 15 miles behind. The weather reports were bad, but not impossible. A storm was brewing, but this wasn't just any storm. This was a November witch. November is the month for shipwrecks on Lake Superior. The gales of November are a real phenomenon. What most people don't realize is that a November witch is a terrifying Great Lakes phenomenon. It's a weather bomb. A cold, dry air mass from Canada slams into a warm, wet air mass from the Gulf of Mexico, and they collide right over the relatively warm lake water. The pressure drops and the winds explode. By the next day, November 10th, the storm had turned into a monster. The winds howled at over 70 miles per hour. That's hurricane force. The waves climbed to 25 feet, and some captains that night reported seeing rogue waves, 35-foot monsters. They called them the Three Sisters, a series of three massive waves that hit one after another so fast a ship can't recover. The Fitzgerald was in the thick of it. Around 3.30 in the afternoon, Captain McSorley radioed the Anderson. His voice was calm, but the news was bad. He reported, I have a fence rail down, two vents lost or damaged, and a list. A list. That's the one word no sailor wants to hear. It means the ship is taking on water. McSorley also reported that his radar was gone. He was sailing blind in a hurricane, using the Anderson to guide him toward the safety of Whitefish Bay, which was only about 17 miles away so close. For the next few hours, the two captains stayed in contact. The Anderson was getting hit by the same waves. Her captain, Bernie Cooper, later said he watched the Fitzgerald get hit by two of those three sisters' waves. He saw her get completely buried in water, vanish from sight, and then shake it all off. And it happened about 6.30 in the evening. And I just wonder if those two seas didn't catch up with the Fitzgerald. I just got to thinking about it afterwards, that those seas were that big. They rolled up his deck and was going to put his bow down under the water. At 7.10 in the evening, the Anderson's first mate radioed the Fitzgerald one last time. He asked a simple question. Fitzgerald, how are you holding up? The crazy part is the last words from McSorley. They weren't a cry for help. They weren't a mayday. His voice came back, calm as ever. We are holding our own. Just 10 minutes later, the Fitzgerald disappeared from the Anderson's radar screen. One minute, she was a solid blip. The next, nothing, just static. No SOS, no distress flares, no final calls. 
The ship, her captain, and her 28 crewmen were just gone, swallowed by the lake. The Anderson turned around and went back out into that monster storm to search for her friend, but there was nothing to find, just two smashed lifeboats and some debris. Four days later, a Navy plane found the wreck. It was 530 feet down, right where the Anderson said it would be. The ship was in two pieces, the bow and stern separated, telling a story of a sudden, violent end. That sudden, silent end is what created a 50-year mystery. Too fast for a mayday. With no survivors, investigators were left with only the broken wreck and a lot of questions. This kicked off a 50-year debate, pitting the government, the ship's owners, and the sailors' families against each other. Basically, there were four main theories. Theory one, the leaky hatch covers. This was the official United States Coast Guard report in 1977. They claimed the ship's 21 massive steel hatch covers were not properly secured. The report said the powerful waves tore them loose and water poured into the cargo hold, dragging the bow down like a submarine. But here's the catch. The families of the crew were outraged. This theory basically blamed the men for their own end, saying they didn't do their jobs. Captain McSorley was a meticulous captain. His crew was experienced. They insisted there was no way they would have been that sloppy in a storm. Theory two, the Six Fathom Shoal. This is the theory the Lake Carriers Association, the ship owners pushed. They argued the ship was wounded long before she sank. Remember how Captain Cooper on the Anderson was tracking the Fitzgerald? He said the Fitzgerald had sailed very close to a dangerous shallow area called the Six Fathom Shoal. The charts for that area were known to be bad. The idea is she scraped her bottom, tearing a gash in the hull. This would explain McSorley's report of a list. If this is true, the Fitzgerald was slowly, silently taking on water for hours. The storm just finished the job. Theory three, catastrophic structural failure. This one is terrifying. What most people don't realize is that the Fitzgerald had been lengthened in 1969. They literally cut her in half and added a new 84-foot midsection to carry more cargo. Some engineers worried this stretch job weakened the ship. The load line rules were changed to allow the ship to load deeper. And she was allowed to go down about another four feet in order to carry more cargo. Even the two latest captains did say the ship handled differently. Well, of course it did. It was four feet further in the water. The theory is that one of those three sisters' waves lifted the bow and another lifted the stern, leaving the long, heavy midsection completely unsupported. With thousands of tons of ore inside, the stress would be unimaginable. Snap. The ship would have broken in half on the surface and sunk in seconds. This would explain why there was no mayday call. The end would have been that fast. I wonder if we can't shift the thinking to this to this other possibility, and that is that the Fitzgerald flexed and broke open on the surface and flooded simply because her hull broke in half and, of course, ended up in two pieces. Theory four, the rogue wave. This is similar but focuses on one monster wave. A single 35-foot wave or bigger could have washed over the entire ship, pushing the bow down and under before it had a chance to recover. The reported wave conditions at around 25 feet would be really challenging for this vessel. But if there was some more extreme version, you know, if there was a really large wave that came by, some rogue wave, um, then uh, this kind of bow and side damage might well have been caused by a wave impact on the surface. With the front submerged and the engine still pushing, she would have driven herself straight to the bottom. For 50 years, everyone argued about these four theories, storm, shoal, or steel. But none of them, not one, can explain what that drone just found. A polished, spotless brass telegraph. That discovery changes everything. What the anomaly means. So here's the deal. We are now left with a puzzle. The impossible anomaly inside the bridge doesn't fit with any of the old ideas. People watching this are looking for a mystery. And for 50 years, the mystery was what sank the ship? Now the mystery is, what is that thing in the control room? Let's talk down to earth. Are we missing a key detail? The thing is that brass telegraph forces us to look at new, stranger possibilities. 
Could a massive magnetic anomaly, which are known to happen in the iron-rich bedrock under Lake Superior, have caused the disaster? Sailors have reported compasses spinning wildly in that area. Maybe a magnetic pulse scrambled McSorley's radar and did something else. Something that, 50 years later, is still repelling silt and rust from that one object. Or what about the cargo? Taconite pellets or processed iron? Could a chemical reaction sparked by water flooding the hold have sent a massive electrical charge through the ship? Could it have magnetized the bridge, turning that one brass object into a scientific curiosity? What most people don't realize is that the wreck is a protected grave. No one can go down and touch it. No one can recover that telegraph to study it. So for now, all we have is that one baffling video from a drone. The old theories of storms and shoals are logical. They make sense, but they don't explain the anomaly. The wild theories of UFOs or lake monsters are just stories. But the polished brass, that's real. The drone saw it. It's the one clue that tells us that the end of the Edmund Fitzgerald was stranger, more violent, and more mysterious than any of us ever imagined. That polished brass is a message from the deep. But what is it trying to tell us? Was the Fitzgerald a victim of the storm or something else entirely? Let us know your theory below, and don't forget to like and subscribe.